So I was just asking if there's any hockey fans in here. And if you follow the NHL, you would have learned that uh, earlier this summer, the NHL awarded a, a franchise to Las Vegas. So they're going to be playing hockey in Las Vegas. But the interesting thing about it is the mayor of Toronto is all upset about Las Vegas getting a team. Because now he wants an NHL team as well. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to give a, a, a presentation here. And I'll try to keep it fairly short because we're getting a little bit on in the, on the evening. But we're going to talk about soil fertility and kind of big picture soil fertility. And I'm going to relate it all back to forages because uh, a lot of you guys uh, are, are growing forages and I'm going to relate it back to that. And every one of the talks tonight, sometime during that talk, we did, we did touch on fertility a little bit. Peter talked on it. We talked on when we're looking at the different varieties out there, which ones respond uh, to better fertility. We definitely talked about it when we're talking about the planters, etc. So we're going we're gonna to touch on some of the fertility things that uh, will affect you guys. So soil testing, why bother? And it, it's almost kind of like what uh, Sean was saying out there, you know, talking about your planter, well, why, why bother looking at it? Well, really, if you're going to put a crop in the ground and you're going to set up your planter right, we better start with dealing with the soil and the soil fertility. And that soil testing, it really removes the guesswork out of what, what nutrients you've got. And one of the things Peter said out there is if you're dealing with single digits phosphorus levels with your winter wheat, you better pay attention to it. Well, how do you know if you've got single level phosphorus levels? Soil test, and then it'll tell you. So that soil testing really provides that nutritional map of the soil. And when we look at those potassium levels in this example, this is a field that we had done some work on where uh, we actually site-specific sampled that field. And every little flag you see there is where we took a soil core. And it can show you how that fertility changes across the field. And that picture now really is that old saying, it's, it's worth a thousand words. It tells you where to, what you're doing and how to work with it. And when we talk about soil testing, we can't manage what you don't measure. So if you're measuring that soil and you're creating a history, you can start to manage it. You can see where your levels are going. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are you maintaining them? And you can really start to manage it and evaluate your fertility practices. But it also helps you enable, enables you to do that forward planning as you start to think about, you know, not going to be too long. You're going to be ordering a lot of your seed for next year. You need to start looking at what are you going to do for your soil fertility practices. So you can. With soil testing, you get that report, and now you can start to plan your fertility needs. And it really identifies that hidden hunger that really start to become evident this time of year or a little earlier, depending on the crop. As the crop starts to mature, develop a cob or develop a pod, those sorts of things, you start to see those nutritional deficiencies. And it really identifies those limiting factors. So a lot of you, I'm sure, have seen this little chart before, this little diagram. It's just a, a wooden bucket and each stave in that bucket represents a nutrient or uh, a practice that you may do on your farm. And each of those practices or those nutrients, your yield is limited by that lowest stave in the bucket or that practice that's, that's hurting you. So as Sean said, if it was a matter of not replacing the chains and you're seeing skips, that's limiting you right there, isn't it? If it's fertility and maybe it's potassium that's, that's low, that's limiting you. But you need to measure that and understand it so you, you don't have those limiting factors. And as we start to talk about nutrients, um, each crop has some of the main nutrients that uh, really drive its growth and its yield. But all those nutrients interact with each other. This is a, a chart that's been used for years and years. It's called Mulder's chart. And you can start to, to look at the interaction of each nutrient. And you can't take one nutrient on its own and just say, oh, if it's wheat, I've put on my nitrogen, I should be fine. Because there's other nutrients that uh, interact with it. If you're talking about forages, alfalfa specifically, a lot of people say, oh, if I put it on some potash, I'm fine. You need to look at that big picture and the interaction of all those nutrients and uh, how they play a role with each other. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, here this evening. So for every action, there's an equal, equal and opposite reaction. 
So every nutrient has another nutrient that will start to limit its yield. So when we start to look at those fields, um, every field has something that's limiting its potential. And the, the nutrient availability is influenced by a lot of factors. So could be crop sensitivity, different crops are sensitive to different nutrients. That was touched on tonight. Um, when we were talking, when Peter was talking about uh, wheat and the importance of phosphorus. Soil type, uh, that can influence the nutrient availability. Um, sandy soils have different issues than a muck soil versus a clay soil as it relates to nutrients. Soil pH, we'll touch on that. Um, how important is it to manage that pH and make sure uh, you're, you're maximizing your nutrients as it relates to pH. And nutrient interactions, we talked about climate. Climate has uh, temperature, soil temperatures, air temperatures have a lot of influence on nutrient uptake in the crop, uh, moisture levels, et cetera. And that overall yield obviously is driven by your nutrient availability and of course your farming practices. If you're no-till versus um, uh, uh, tilled fields or minimum tilled, uh, that sort of thing. So one of the things that we hear a lot of times is uh, I was thinking about when, uh, when Sean was talking about the planter and how important it is on your farm is a lot of fellows will, will hire in a planter uh, to, to do their custom work. And in some cases, if you need to be putting down a significant amount of nutrient, depending on the fertility on that farm, maybe the best practice is to be putting a, a dry along with a liquid, those sorts of things. But you need to make sure the equipment matches your fertility practices. So then when you're putting down that crop, you're maximizing its potential. And you're not li limiting your potential just based on equipment. There's a lot of options out there. Make sure you're doing the right thing. So, this point I want to make here is uh, probably one of the most important ones. And uh, I get a little bit on a soapbox when I start to talk about soil testing really demonstrates due diligence and best management practices. And what I mean by that is in our industry, in agriculture, we get attacked daily by special interest groups, by the media, and they'll, they'll twist things and turn things to make it look like in this industry we're not doing the right thing. So as, as I'm sure all of you are aware, um, the use of fertilizers in, for a home lawn is really restricted now. Um, sorry, not use of fertilizer, use of pesticides is really restricted for uh, cosmetic use in, in home lawns. If we're not careful, we're going to start to see those sorts of uh, regulations transfer into agriculture when it starts to come to looking at plant nutrients. So one of the things I like to challenge a group like this uh, to do is next spring, on the long weekend in May, that's probably the busiest weekend of the year for all the garden centers and the hardware stores. And I know you guys on the long weekend in May, you have nothing to do, all your crops in, all your spraying's done, and uh, you'll just be sitting there with idle time on your hands. Go down though, in the spring of the year, and check out one of those hardware stores or those garden centers. And I challenge you to find a bag of fertilizer for home use on the home lawn that has any significant amount of phosphorus in it. You can't find it. The, not because it's regulated, but what's happened is a lot of these large fertilizer companies are feeling the pressures from special interest groups, so they've taken phosphorus out of lawn fertilizer. Phosphorus in lawn fertilizer is just as important as it is in wheat or in any of your other crops. It helps build a good root system, helps that, that plant to uh, survive in a drought situation, in stress situations. Not allowed to use cosmetic use of herbicides, but actually a good fertility program on a home lawn will help to keep a robust lawn and keep, lawns and keep the weeds out of there. So what's gonna happen if we're, if we're not careful, we can start to see the pressures of special interest groups affect us in our, our nutrient applications. Keep in mind, we do have some watersheds in, here in North America, in, in Ontario and in, the, in Ohio in the, that we do need to spay, spend very special attention to nutrient levels to manage those properly. And soil testing is a big, big part of that. 
So when we talk about soil testing, how often should you soil test? Anybody want to shout out an answer? Every three years. Anybody else? Higher or lower? Let's have an auction. We've got three. Do you want to go, do you want to go up four years? Do you want to go down two years? Peter? Once through a rotation. Once through a rotation. So what does that mean? I guess it depends on your rotation. Yeah, if the rotation gets super long, maybe you've got to do it twice. Maybe twice. All, all good answers. As a general rule of thumb, every two to three years will give you enough information to create that history of that soil and the nutrient levels, okay? So what Peter's saying is once through your rotation. So if you're a three-year rotation, that means you're doing it every three years. I wouldn't suggest you need to do it a whole lot more than that unless you've got some problem areas or some problem farms where you're trying to change some things and, and manage them a little bit different. But as a general rule, that's probably a good thing good thing to do. And some guys will do it, you know, following wheat every year just because they've got the opportunity to get in there. Uh, other fellows will just every three years, they just sample all their acres. So that's a, a good rule of thumb. I want to talk a little bit about how do you take a good sample. So if you've hired somebody to come in and do your sampling, they're following these, uh, should be following kind of these rules of thumb, but if you're doing some of it on your own, if you're doing what we call a composite sample, so you're, you're doing every you know, 20 to 25 acres are represented by one sample that you're sending to the, to the laboratory, we normally wouldn't want to see more than 20 to 25 acres in a single sample. You just get way too much variability. Um, but when you're doing that and collecting those cores, we'd like to see you taking one to two cores per acre and you're putting those in a clean bucket and mixing those up. So at the end of a 20 or 25 acre field, you should have taken somewhere around 40 to 50 cores out of that area. And that represents that, that field fairly well. Now, keep in mind that the bucket you're using to mix those samples in, get a, a good clean new bucket, plastic bucket, label it, soil sampling only, and put it on the top shelf where nobody's gonna get it and drain oil into it and all those sorts of things because you want to keep it dedicated to that, all right? The other thing is, when you do collect those cores and put them in that bucket, make sure you mix it really well and make a nice consistency in there so it looks like a homogenized sample. I can't tell you how many times we receive a soil sample bag at the lab and we open it up and it looks like a couple little dog turds in there. And, and what they've done is they may have taken a lot of cores but really they're sending one or two little cores to us that maybe represent that one spot in the field. It really isn't giving you valuable information back. So what you do in the field is so important to getting valuable information back so you can make good management decisions on. And for the most part, try to be as consistent as you can at getting to a six inch depth. Some soil sampling probes actually will have a little notch in them at six inch depth. If you're soil sampling your own field and you don't uh, have a mark on it, just take the grinder and put a little notch in it. And what'll happen is you'll see a little bit of dirt sticks in that notch and you'll see just a little bit of a black line. That's your six inch depth. All right. And then the most important part is make a map and, and uh, keep record of where those samples were taken from and which fields they came from. Because there's nothing worse than getting your results back and they go, gosh, I've called that field one and field two, but which one is field one and which, field is, uh, which one is field two? So when you do label them and give them a name, make sure when you come back in two or three years and sample again, that you're using that same name so now you can create the histories from field to field. Okay, so keep a good record and a good numbering system. What I wanna just talk about, I've got it kind of illustrated up here is, you know, you get your typical farm with, with these different fields and you collect those samples and you put them in your bucket and you, you mix them up really, really well. And then you put them in that, um, you take some of that dirt and you put it in that soil sampling bag. You send us about a cup of soil that will represent maybe 20 acres. When we get to the lab, when those samples get to the lab, first thing we do is we log those samples in to our system and then we, we dry them and then we start the analysis on it. So when we do the analysis, so what you're seeing here, this little crucible is, in this case, we're doing organic matter. 
It's, uh, it's a little bit bigger than a, a thimble. Um, it's kind of the, the amount of soil that's in there that we're doing the analysis. And it's amazing that the soil you took from this field and put in that bucket and put into this bag and then we dried it and ground it and did the analysis, it's very, very consistent as long as you do a good job in the field when you start. It really starts with the quality of sample that you take and, and send to the lab. So I just want to stress that, that it's really important on your end you do a really good job. So many times what we see is um, if it's a company that's doing the sampling or uh, if it's your own farm, what do you do? You send the young guy out or the young 10 year old and say, oh, go get me some soil samples. That really should be the job that the senior guy on the farm is doing. Because what it does is when you're walking those fields or you're riding them on your four wheeler, you're really looking at a whole lot of other things. You're assessing the crop. You can tell a lot of what's going on when you're soil sampling. So that really is the job uh, that's probably the most important uh, job that you could, you could take on. Okay. Actually, before we get into uh, some of these deficiencies, there's a slide I thought of here tonight that I should have put in um, for you guys, uh, for your interest. So every uh, five years, the International Plant Nutrition Institute, which used to be, uh, it's called IPNI, used to be called the Phosphate and Potash Institute. They do a survey of all the soil sampling labs right across North America, and then they compile those results to see what's the trend from province to province, state to state, are soil sample le nutrient levels going up or are they going down? So last year, 2015, was the, uh, a five-year cycle, so they did them again, uh, did that survey. What do you guys think? What's happening in agricultural soil? Are our soil test levels in general, are they going up or are they going down here in Ontario? I have a going down. It, who would agree with that? Going down? Who wants to say going up? So about a third of you put up your hand saying going down. I didn't see anybody put up their hand going up. And I guess the other third, maybe you just want to get out of here. You just don't care. Um, in general, we are decreasing. And that's fairly true from all across every province and uh, majority of the states in the U.S. We do have some anomalies in, but that's a general trend. What do you think is happening when we look at soil test levels as it pertains to golf courses, lawn and gardens, um, or lawns, sports fields, those sorts of things? Are they going down or are they going up? Up, who would agree going up? So here's what I'll tell you. I went through and I looked through our data system at a and Labs and I sorted out all the samples that were clearly labeled that came from a golf course, a lawn, or a sports or recreation field. And I compared those numbers to all the samples that come from agriculture fields. They're almost identical. So, one thing to note here is those levels, they're not higher than what we have in agricultural soils, and they're not going up. What does the public think? public thinks that everything's going up and we're doing a bad job. That could be the furthest thing from the truth, isn't it? Because in agriculture, you guys, you know, do you all have hip problems because your wallets are so fat and you're sitting on that money? No, I mean, we're all trying to do a, a good diligent job, right? And use the, the nutrients or the herbicides or those sorts of things as efficiently as we can and as cost effectively as we can, but that's not what the public thinks. And I'll, I'll just tell you a little story. Um, I was raised in Northern Ontario. So when I say Northern Ontario, sorry, Peter, I don't mean Dundalk, and I don't mean New Liskert. We went down south to New Liskert. So I was raised near Cochrane, Ontario, okay? And so New Liskert is what they call the clay belt. That Cochrane, Black River, Matheson area is what they call a little clay belt. And apparently that's the pot of gold right now because everybody's moving up there. That's where I was raised on a cow-calf operation. And when we sold our stalkers and feeders, it was an all-day affair. We went down to Nalisker to sell them. So anyway, there are seven, seven uh, in my family, uh, four boys and three girls. Um, I'm, I work in agriculture. I have a brother who's a veterinarian. He's working in agriculture. But the rest of my siblings, 
they do other things, some engineers, school teachers, etc. I have a sister who lives in Cambridge. She's a school teacher. And it's New Year's Day, my family all comes to my place and we watch football. And what happens is we have a TV downstairs for football. There's a TV upstairs for anybody else who doesn't want to watch football. But what happens is a bunch of family members come downstairs and start talking, getting in our way because we're trying to watch football. And my sister being one of them. So at some point throughout the evening, I'll nudge my brother and I'll say, watch this. We'll get rid of my sister. So I'll make a comment to her about herbicides or GMOs or fertilizer. And she goes off the deep end about how bad they are. And at one point, she gets so mad that she goes upstairs, then we have peace and quiet downstairs. <laughs> but here's reality, though. She was raised on the same farm I was, in the same family. We, I mean, she helped do chores as much as the rest of us did. But somewhere along the line, her thinking was calibrated a little bit differently, and now she thinks everything we're doing in agriculture is, is horrible, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I don't know what happened along those lines, but a lot of the public thinks what we're doing is, is trying to harm everybody. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. So let's make sure that we're doing due diligence when we're talking about soil sampling and all those sorts of things that we are doing the right thing and we're demonstrating it. Okay, I told you I'd get on my soapbox a little bit and that's the little story to, to help reinforce it. Okay, we'll play a little game here and, we, and then we'll talk about forages in specific. So alfalfa, who wants to name that deficiency? Shout it out, anybody know? Boron, absolutely right. Boron deficiency. So what does boron do in the plant? It really helps in that nodule formation, which is important for nitrogen production, and helps in potassium uptake and in that terminal bud uh, formation, okay? What about this one? No, it's, I know it's kind of a picture from a long ways away. Maybe a little bit tricky for you in alfalfa. What are you seeing? We're seeing some lighter colored Alfalfa there. Anybody wish take a guess? Who's got a prize? We've got some prizes, don't we? Johnson, at Peter, at, at supper, you were saying how bad your eyesight is, and from back there, you can identify sulfur. That's awesome. Let, oh, man. Let's at least give him a round of applause. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that is sulfur deficiency. So wh why are we talking a lot more about sulfur? Well, part of it is back, um, you know, we're talking about into the 80s, we used to see a lot of sulfur uh, surplus coming down from atmospheric uh, depositions or acid rain. And really that was just because of, you know, a little bit more loosey-goosey environmental laws and we were getting a lot of free sulfur. That doesn't hold true to today. So the map on, on the left here is just showing higher sulfur concentrations. And um, we're talking about, this is uh, uh, sulfur deposition, so that's not soil levels, but what was coming down in the form of acid rain. All you need to know is this black and blue area, somewhere around 10 pounds per acre of sulfur rain we were just re re receiving from crops. And then we look at it a little bit closer today, we're, we're nowhere near that. And this is actually from early 2000, 2002. So we're starting to add a lot more sulfur back into our fertility programs because the crops need it and we're, not, we're just not getting as much as we should. What does sulfur do? So it really helps with its protein formation. It promotes that nodule formation and encourages more vigorous plant growth. So a rule of thumb is um, especially when we talk about crops like uh, corn and, and wheat, for about every 10 pounds of nitrogen, one pound of sulfur. That's just a good rule of thumb. I mean, obviously we're gonna go buy a soil report and that sort of thing. One thing we forget a lot though, is we're not normally putting a lot of nitrogen down on our alfalfa fields, and why is that? It produces, its own. produces its own, absolutely. But don't forget, even though we're not putting the nitrogen down, we most likely have a need to put some sulfur down because the crop's still needing it, even though it's, it's producing its own nitrogen. Okay. So when we start talking about sulfur, just keep in mind, for most of your crops, you want to try to apply it in that 10 to 1 ratio for, with nitrogen. Name that deficiency. 
Anybody want to shout that one out? Good. Trick question. It's not a deficiency, it's leaf hopper injury. So leaf hopper clamps onto the end of that leaf and sucks out the juice and we get this inverted V and sometimes gets fu uh, confused with a, a nutrient deficiency. Good. That's pretty sharp to pick that out. Tried to fool you but couldn't do it. Name the deficiency on this one. Anybody? So we, we see a, a smaller leaflet and then some of that uh, chlorosis right on the margin. Calcium. It's a calcium deficiency. The reason why I don't expect you guys will see it, a lot of these soils through this area are ha highly calcareous soils. So you have calcium levels. They're high CEC soils, high calcium levels. Not uncommon to see, Dennis, what, 2,800, 3,000 ppm for calcium? Yeah, very common. So not likely you would see a lot of calcium deficiency through the most of, most of your area here. This one? Heard something in the back. Shut it out. Potassium deficiency. So potassium deficiency on most crops is, is very similar where you get this uh, yellowing down, down the leaf margins. Uh, you'll start to see it sometimes on alfalfa. You start to see some white flecking in there as well. Potassium extremely important in, in alfalfa for protein synthesis and that stomatal function and, and disease resistance. So what is the nodule formation for whatever reason? Because nitrogen is normally producing its own, or alfalfa is normally producing its own nitrogen. So what, what's nitrogen doing in the plant? Uh, key point there to remember is it's the primary building block for amino acids and proteins. So nitrogen and sulfur are the primary building blocks for protein in a crop. If you're growing alfalfa, what are you, most of you guys doing? It You're putting it back in the barn. So a good protein source. So it's important to, to be managing that. Okay, so when we talk about these key nutrients for uh, alfalfa and forages, low levels of any of those nutrients can start to, to limit your yield and have a negative effect on the quality as well. So using the soil analysis and uh, in conjunction usually with a, a plant analysis can really help you monitor that crop and make sure that what you, the seed you're putting in the ground, you're setting up for success at harvest time. Okay? And that soil sample can really help you to interpret those, uh, the soil uh, qualities and then make a good management decision from that and uh, try to give you the highest yield. So when we start to think about the hidden hunger, those visual symptoms are useful to identify the deficiency in the crop when we see it in the crop, but that's really too late. You've already lost quality and yield. So you want to know, anticipate what those deficiencies are ahead of time so you don't see them in the crop and uh, already have lost that yield. So when we have those optimal uh, nutrient requirements, if they're not obvious, then um, that soil analysis really removes the, the guesswork for you. And when we start to um, look at the different nutrients in the soil, I just wanted to give you a few rules of thumb here. So for phosphorus, depending on the soil type, but it takes somewhere around five to 18 pounds of P205, so that's the form of phosphorus in your fertilizer, to increase your soil test one part per million. So when you start to think about those numbers, that's over and above what the crop would take out. It's a bit of a longer process to try to increase soil fertility when we start talking about phosphorus. Potassium's not a whole lot different. When we talk about potassium, somewhere around eight to 32 pounds of K2O to increase your potassium one part per million. Again, that's over and above what the crop takes out. So if you wanted to try to increase one part per million, just roughly, it's gonna take, you know, 12, 15 pounds, 20 pounds of K2O to increase at one part per million. So if you're deficient already, you better make sure you're feeding that crop up front. So when we talk about soil pH, so that's really the measure of acidity uh, in the soil or that measure that hydrogen ion activity in the soil. So what's important to know is 
as soil pH changes, so if you have a low pH, um, so seven is what we call a neutral pH. As your pH drops, some nutrients, their availability starts to become less. So you might have lots of that nutrient in the soil, just the plant is in the, as available to the plant. Same thing can happen as your, nutrient, as your pH starts to increase. So the ideal pH for most crops, we tend to say somewhere in that you know, six and a half to seven range, that ballpark. The reason for that is if you look at most of these nutrients, that's where they're most available, okay? What's the pH for most of you guys in this area? Most of you guys are somewhere in that seven to seven and a half or maybe seven, six, seven, eight, some cases, Dennis? Oh, yeah. yeah. As high as eight. So what's that telling you? Normally when we talk about pH issues, we're talking about low pHs where you have to lime. For a lot of you guys, we're talking about a little bit higher pHs where we can start to have some availability issues, especially with some of these micronutrients. So it's important to pay attention to some of what your pHs are and what you're doing with your, your fertility program. So when we look at your pHs and how it affects nutrient availability, let's just take a low pH of four and a half. You've got somewhere around 30% availability of your NPK compared to if you get that closer to that six and a half to seven range, okay? But when I back up a little bit, you guys are in closer to the, the seven and a half range. Most of your macronutrients, you don't really have too much availability of problem except for phosphorus. Okay. So here's the thing to note though. Dennis said not uncommon to see some pHs of, of approaching eight, but seven and a half is not, 7.5 is not uncommon in this trading area. If you're doing a composite sample, so you're taking, you know, if this is a 20 acre field and you're taking one to two cores per acre, you're really kind of getting an average of all these different pHs, but what can happen is you can have some areas in those fields where you've got low or extremely high pHs, but it's being masked because you've got a composite sample. So in some cases, especially when we're talking forages, if you have a low pH, you're, when you, as soon as you go to alfalfa, you're gonna see it right away because that alfalfa is gonna be stunted and it's just not gonna perform the way it should compared to the rest of the field. That'll be a good indicator that you've got a low pH situation. And if you go soil sample that's separate from the rest of the field, it'll probably indicate that you've got a low pH. So that'll be the, one of the quickest ways for you guys that are growing forages that it'll show up. This is just a, an indication of a, a field that had low pH where we see this good alfalfa, it was lined. This area, there was no lime applied. And you can see, I mean, seeding rates and everything were the same, just that alfalfa is not establishing. Okay, let's put a few numbers to what we've talked about as it relates to uh, alfalfa. So when your crop tests are in the sufficiency range and soil tests indicate that there's no deficiencies, it's still a good idea to replace what the crop's removing so you don't get into that deficiency range, okay? But when we start to talk about you know, standard tables, there's all kinds of different tables. If you visit our website, we have some tables on there that say uh, for certain yield of corn, um, we, you have this much nutrient removal, barley, wheat, alfalfa, etc. okay? There's all, all sorts of those tables available. They give you a general idea. But if you really wanna see what you're doing on your farm, is especially if you're growing forages, you can really calculate that quite simply. So when we start to look at your forage analysis, so this is your feed analysis for your forage, those numbers, when we start to talk about um, your phosphorus and potassium that's in those forages, they're expressed as a percentage of dry matter and normal dry hay will be somewhere around seven to 10 percent moisture or 90 to 93 percent dry matter, okay? So you need to convert those to tons of hay or dry tons of dry matter, and then we can do a calculation of how much nutrient is actually in that, how much is being removed. So if we look at that, on that, the other thing you need to know is on the a feed analysis for a forage report for what you're feeding in the barn, those, the, the phosphorus and potash, or potassium, is expressed in elemental P and elemental K, whereas on a 
solar report, we express it as P205 and K2O. Okay? So we need to convert P to P205 to get our fertilizer requirement. You need to multiply the phosphorus from your forage report by 2.29. That's the conversion factor. And to convert K to K2O, multiply by 1.2. So if you wanted to know how much P205 and K2O are required to replace what a hay crop of four tons per acre removes, so is four tons per acre a big, big yielding crop? Yeah, the dry year, yeah, some of you guys are going, oh, I, love, I love that this year, right? But it's, it's not that big of a yield, is it, really? Kind of an average crop. So hay at four tons per acre at 10% moisture means it's 90% dry matter. So you take 90% times four tons per acre times 2,200 pounds per acre means you're harvesting 7,920 pounds per acre of dry matter off of four tons to the acre of alfalfa, okay? So if the forage analysis report indicates that it's 0.35% phosphorus and 3.1% potassium, then the P205 removed, how do we figure that out to see if, if you're fertilizing properly just to meet crop removal? It's 0.35% times the 7,920 pounds per acre times 2.29 equals 63 pounds per acre of P205 was removed from four tons uh, of forage. For K2O, the math on that is 3.1% times 7,920 times 1.2 equals 295 pounds per acre of K2O. What does that equal? 295 pounds per acre, if you convert that to uh, a ton of 0060, what's the quick math on that? 490, 500 pounds. So your four ton of alfalfa, you would have to put 500 pounds per acre of 0060 on just to replace what was removed. So if you've got low fertility to begin with, you remember back to the slide, roughly just a rough number of how many pounds of K2O does it take to move one part per million? 20. It's not an easy job, is it? If you've got low fertility. So many of you in the crowd, uh, I recognize you and we've, we've spoken a little bit o over the evening. I worked in this, in this area for, I don't know, like 15 or 16 years for a company called Nutrite in Elmira. And working with most of you guys on a lot of your farms and stuff. One of the things you do see is when you're coming out of alfalfa, you'll typically see your, your potassium levels are dropping because you haven't supplied everything the alfalfa removed. But lots of times when you're moving that into your corn rotation, you're getting a little more potassium on than the corn fully removes because your manure and stuff, those levels come back up. So it's okay to see this kind of cycle as long as your potash levels are where you want them. What you don't want to see is this up and down cycle that's going down continuously though. So you want to make sure you're managing that. Now I know some of you guys are probably thinking if you're dairy farmers going, but I don't want to put potassium on my alfalfa fields because what does that do to my cows? Milk fever, right? Why does it cause milk fever? because it can mess up the metabolism of calcium and that causes milk fever. The issue isn't um, fertilizing your alfalfa. If you don't fertilize your alfalfa, you're just gonna have a low yielding alfalfa that's high in potassium. Alfalfa is just gonna be high in potassium because it's a luxury consumer of potassium and it needs potassium to grow. What you really need to do is those dry cows, make sure you're feeding them more of a grassy mix, not an alfalfa, alfalfa mix. That's all I have for this evening.